Hello, everyone. Konnichiwa. <laughs> Welcome to my talk, Fibers are the Right Solution. My name is Samuel, and today we're going to be talking about how to make Ruby more scalable. So firstly, let us consider the question, what is scalability? What does it mean to be scalable? Here we have a processor doing work. For example, the job could be a web request. In order for a system to be scalable, adding more hardware should give a proportional improvement to job processing capacity. The key point is that the improvement is proportional. If we double the amount of hardware, we should be able to do twice as much work. Why is scalability important? Scalability is a measure of the efficiency of a system with respect to the work it must do. When we create systems, designing for efficiency is not enough. We must consider how efficiency changes as the workload grows. This is a critical consideration, not just for technical reasons, but also for businesses who depend on Ruby. Efficient systems are also good for the planet. The technology sector is responsible for about 2% of global carbon emissions. I am a father, and not a day goes past that I don't think about the impact we have both as individuals and as a collective on this incredible planet we live on. It is something that, as software engineers, I believe we need to improve. So is Ruby scalable? Actually, we need to consider the context in which we are asking this question. The biggest one by far is Ruby web applications. Ruby is used on about a million websites globally. And yet there have been many cases discussed where scaling Ruby has been difficult. From the systems I've observed over the past couple of years, I've seen Ruby web applications often spending a large proportion of time waiting on database queries and other forms of blocking I.O. In this particular case, in a 60-second sample, 10 seconds were spent doing actual processing and 50 seconds were spent waiting on blocking I.O. Blocking I.O. is by far the single biggest contributor to general latency and throughput issues especially in Ruby web applications. The current design of Ruby makes it difficult to utilize hardware and resources effectively. So how do we maximize hardware utilization? This problem is already solved by modern operating systems, but that was not always the case. Let us go back in time to the late 1950s. This is a picture of an IBM 709 mainframe it was one of the last computers to use valves rather than transistors. It was also the first computer on which time sharing was experimented with. Time sharing is a way to improve the utilization of hardware by scheduling multiple jobs to share common hardware resources more efficiently. One of the biggest sources of latency in computer programs at the time was reading and writing to tape-based storage. Seeking was especially slow. Yeah, Seeking was especially slow and could take tens of seconds, as the tapes physically took a long time to wind from one reel to the other. A typical data processing system needs to perform a number of operations. Seeking to a specific location, reading the data, and processing it, then writing the results back out. The latency of the tape drive causes the main processor to spend a lot of time idle, waiting for the operations to complete. Even though hardware has improved significantly, the relative difference in performance between CPU and I.O. devices is still similar. The area of this box represents the time it takes to do a single CPU instruction, which is about one nanosecond. Most modern CPUs have a local cache which is pretty fast to access, somewhere on the order of tens of nanoseconds. The main memory, the system memory is quite a bit slower as the CPU has to use memory controller to communicate with the external RAM chips. It's on the order of hundreds of nanoseconds. 
Main storage, like a solid state disk, is significantly slower, on the order of milliseconds. You can clearly see the latency of accessing the disk completely blows away anything that happens within the CPU. Sending data over the network is slower still, on the order of tens to hundreds of milliseconds. In the time it takes to receive one network packet, we could execute 10 million instructions on the CPU. So can we avoid being idle? If a processor is executing a job, and that job must wait for I.O., we can schedule another job to run. By doing this, we can improve hardware utilization. Even if a job isn't waiting on I.O., sometimes we will force a context switch. This is called time slicing. This kind of interleaving of work is referred to generally as concurrency. Concurrency allows us to improve the utilization of hardware by sharing it between multiple jobs. Another way to improve utilization is to increase the available hardware, for example, adding an extra processor. Each processor can interact with the shared storage system. However, if they both try to access it at the same time, they will have contention. The I.O. request cannot start until the previous one completes, and this causes the processor to wait. This kind of simultaneous execution is referred to as parallelism. Parallelism allows us to maximize the utilization of hardware by ensuring different parts of the system are in balance with each other. So how does this apply to Ruby? A big focus for the past several years has been improving the performance of the Ruby interpreter. Is Ruby fast enough? Let's assume we could make Ruby 10 times faster. What happens to this hypothetical application? What took 10 seconds now only takes one second, and that's a big improvement. But we still experienced a lot of idle time, waiting for 50 seconds. And that hasn't changed, even though we improved Ruby significantly. What about if we could make Ruby 100 times faster? Surely that's got to help. <laughs> Is that even possible? Actually, in my experience, Ruby is only about 10 to 100 times faster than native C, so maybe it is achievable with the JIT. <laughs> Unfortunately, the overall latency is still big. Making Ruby faster didn't help very much, because most of the latency is coming from blocking I.O. We didn't optimize the right area. How do we handle more requests? Obviously, interpreter performance is important, but it's not the biggest source of latency in many cases, especially web applications. Can we use multiple processes? Absolutely. The operating system will schedule processes efficiently on multiple processors to maximize hardware parallelism and concurrency. What about threads? Like processes, they allow for parallelism and concurrency. However, because threads operate in the same address space, they can cause data corruption if not used carefully. Unfortunately, threads also have another downside. In MRI, to protect the shared state within the interpreter, the global interpreter lock prevents Ruby threads from running in parallel. How bad is the global interpreter lock? Here is a quick benchmark I did using Falcon, a multi-process, multi-thread, event-driven web server for Ruby. When I was running eight processes, it managed about 60,000 requests per second. What was the overhead of the global interpreter lock? Anyone care for a guess? We lost about three quarters of the performance. That's quite a big reduction. So clearly, processes and threads can help scale Ruby up, but are they sufficient? How many simultaneous connections can we handle? 
How many processes can we create? How much memory does Ruby require per process? In my experience, the average web application is anywhere from 50 to 500 megabytes of main memory per process. What about threads? How many threads can we create? 100? 1,000? 10,000? Can you process can you use processes and threads alone to handle 10,000 requests per second? What about long running connections? What about 100,000 connected web sockets? Do you spawn 100,000 processes, threads? Does your server have 100 gigabytes of memory? Maybe. <laughs> it depends if you're in AWS. We need to go deeper. The proven model for massive scalability is event-driven, non-blocking I.O. Instead of having several processes, one for each connection, and letting the operating system manage the scheduling, we have a single process which asks the operating system what events have occurred on any of the connections we are interested in. By handling many connections in a single process, we reduce the per-connection overhead significantly. Such a design can handle up to, a million, uh, up to millions of connections. It's limited more by how many operations you can process rather than how many connections you have. So how do we handle user logic? When we have one process managing each connection, we can use sequential programming. So we just write one statement after another. Let us consider a sequential program which uses blocking I.O. Firstly, the program connects to a remote system. Then it initializes the count to zero. Then we read data into a buffer to accumulate the size. This is a blocking operation. Once we are done, we return the count. We ensure we close the connection at the end of the function. Finally, this is how you use it. Sequential is easy to read, easy to write, and easy to debug. When using an event loop, we need to invoke user code when the I.O. operation is ready to continue. One of the simplest ways to do this is to use callbacks. When we have a blocking operation, we provide a callback. And when the operation either finishes or fails, the callback is invoked. Here we have the same function, but using hypothetical callbacks. Firstly, we must initiate the connection to the remote host. This operation can block, so we must have a callback when it completes. Because we are using callbacks, the code that uses this function must also be changed to use a callback. If there was a problem, rather than using exceptions, an error would be given. We must handle this explicitly. If we connected successfully, we can start reading data. It turns out that implementing loops using callbacks is pretty tricky. You must first create an anonymous function and use recursion instead of a flat loop. Firstly, we must handle the error. Otherwise, if we got a buffer, we can accumulate its size and recurse. Otherwise, we are finished, and we can yield the result. Finally, we call the lambda to kick off the loop. When you compare that to how simple the loop was in the sequential program, maybe you start to wonder if callbacks are the right choice. So I'm interested. Who, likes, who uses callbacks and who likes using callbacks? Can you put your hand up? Anyone? There must be at least one person. All right, someone over there? So there's a bug in this code. Can you tell me what the, what the bug is? 
there's a t-shirt in it. No, we, we forgot to call paired up clothes. Welcome to Call Back Hell. <laughs> Is this the kind of code you want to write? Does this kind of language make you happy? Async await is a step in the right direction, but it is mostly syntactic sugar for callbacks, so you still need to modify your existing code significantly. Here is the same sequential program using a hypothetical implementation of Ruby async await. Actually, I made a gem called async dash await. Uh, you should try it out. It's almost uh, exactly like this. It's kind of a joke. The async await implementation is almost the same as a sequential implementation, but methods which might block must be marked with async, the keyword, and blocking functions must use the keyword await. That's the usage at the bottom. Let's focus on that. Can anyone see a problem with this? What does puts do? Is puts an IO operation? Does it block? Should we use a wait? Do we need to modify all code that uses puts? Is it safe to leave the keyword off? Unfortunately, it seems to me like the keyword spread to other code like an infection. Welcome to async await hell. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do better? The main question here is not whether these approaches work, because they clearly do in certain cases. But what do we want for Ruby? Should we rewrite existing code just to improve the scalability? What if there was another option? What about using fibers? Everyone's probably wondering what the hell are fibers. Fibers are like functions, but they have their own stack. Here is a normal function called sum, it takes one argument and returns it, which is just the argument that it received. Let's see how it behaves. The first time we call it with 10, the local argument receives the value of 10, and then it returns 10. It's fairly straightforward, and we print it out. The second time we call it, we start again from the top of the function. We call it with the argument 20. The local argument is 20, and we return it, and we print out 20. This is just a normal function that everyone should be familiar with. This time, we will use a fiber. A fiber retains the state between calls. The first time we call it, we will get the initial sum value. Then we have a loop. We will yield the current value, and when we are resumed again, we will accumulate the argument we are given. Let's see how this works. When we resume with the value 10, we come into the fiber and sum is equal to 10. We enter the loop, which calls yield 10, and we come back out and we print it out at the bottom. The second time we call it, we end in where we left off, at the fiber.yield statement. And sum accumulates 20 for a total value of 30, which is then returned when we call fiber.yield. And so we print out the value 30. Fibers have their own stack, so the instruction pointer is not lost when transferring between fibers. How can we use fibers for blocking I.O.? Fibers can yield and resume their operation, 
we can create multiple fibers, one per connection. And when they perform an operation that would block, we yield the I.O. that we want to wait for. When that I.O. is ready, we resume the fiber and it continues from where it left off. Here is an example of two connected sockets. The first connection calls read several times until it would block. Then we yield to the event loop, which adds the I.O. to the I.O. selector. The event loop waits until the operating system gives it back a list of sockets that are ready. Then it loops through all those sockets and resumes the fibers. They pick up where they left off. In this case, client two was writing data, so now it finishes and is reading a response, which isn't available yet. So it yields back to the event loop, the event loop continues processing ready sockets and resumes client one. Client one continues reading data until it would block and then yields back to the event loop. Here is our original synchronous code wrapped into an asynchronous event loop. Notice that the core code, the logic, is identical, and that the usage of the function is identical. This code actually creates two fibers, one for the event loop and one for the body of the function. If you nest async blocks, it will spawn multiple fibers in the same event loop. So how do we make existing code scalable? Ruby is a dynamic language, and because of that, we can replace blocking primitives with non-blocking implementations. This is a pull request to transparently make all IO and Ruby non-blocking. It's on a per-thread basis. This is the best solution to make existing Ruby code scalable with almost no changes. It's a relatively trivial change, which can, which can be easily implemented across MRI, JRuby, and Truffle Ruby. This is actually almost the entire pull request in terms of what modifies uh, MRI. All we do is intercept weight readable and weight writable, and if the thread has a selector defined for it, we invoke the selector with the appropriate method and let the selector handle the rest. Here is an example of one of the tests, which is, uh, is included in that PR. We create a thread. We define a selector. This is a very simple one. Uh, it just uses io.select. We assign it to the current thread. We make some io. We set them to be non-block. We make an enumerator for each character. We create two fibers. One of them is writing, and one of them is reading. And these two operate concurrently. We call selector.run at the bottom, which essentially enters the event loop. Here is what the selector implementation looks like. This is a very uh, simple and uh, not particularly uh, efficient selector design. The run function checks to see if there's anything, any fibers waiting for readable or writable IO. Then we just ask the operating system, tell us when something is ready to be processed. When something is ready for reading, we transfer back to it. Once it's done its job, we come back here, we'll go through the writable list, and we'll transfer to them and come back here. This is the function that MRI uh, calls when it encounters blocking IR, so it schedules it into the event loop. In the future, we can build on more advanced selector designs, but this one is just for the proof of concept in the PR. In the meantime, there is an ecosystem of gems which provides beautiful non-blocking interfaces, including support for Postgres, WebSockets, DNS, HTTP, Redis, and more. 
Async is compatible with all currently supported releases of Ruby, and I will do my best to ensure it's compatible with future releases. Async is the right model because web apps are almost always I.O. bound. The Ruby web ecosystem is really lacking in scalability, e.g. WebSockets on Puma. Async unlocks the next tier of scalability in the most Ruby-like way possible. Brian Powell on migrating from Puma to Falcon. Falcon is a nat native Ruby application server built on top of async. Falcon supports multi-process, multi-thread containers with non-blocking fibers. It supports HTTP 1 and HTTP 2 plus TLS out of the box, along with push promises and all the other features of HTTP 2. Because of its design, it can handle many thousands of connected web sockets. Falcon supports existing synchronous rack middleware. If you can replace an existing library with an asynchronous variant, for example, async Postgres, you can improve the concurrency and handle more requests. So I guess you're all wondering, how does it perform? For IO bound work, it scales very well. Obviously, it will depend on your specific situation and whether you are IO bound or CPU bound. In this benchmark, Puma was not able to peg the CPU, but Falcon scaled up until all CPU cores were fully utilized. Are fibers the right solution? Fibers scale better than threads alone. They allow us to improve concurrency without having contention from the global interpreter lock. Fibers are easier than threads. Fibers allow us to use a largely synchronous programming model which avoids callback hell and avoids the need for new keywords and language constructs. Fibers improve the scalability of existing code. Thanks to the dynamic nature of Ruby, it is straightforward for us to replace existing blocking operations with a non-blocking event reactor. And fibers are the right solution. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to my talk. If you have any questions.